McAllister still going strongly in the closing minutes. Great run by Kevin McAllister! What a goal that is! Delivery's good, there's Hagen! Now McGraw, he scored! It Stokes on a hat-trick! Goal number three for Anthony Stokes! Oh, Austin, saw off Robertson and delivered! Sibold scores! That's the goal! That's the moment! Samuel off and running again. Is it going to be the hat-trick? You know what it is. This is Falkirk Daft. Welcome along to a very special edition of Falkirk Daft. It's Falkirk Daft meets the management as we chat to the gaffer, Mr. John McGuinn, and his assistant and former Bairn, Mr. Paul Smith. I am your host, John McAnally, and joined by my very own co-manager of Falkirk Daft, it is Ross Wayne. How you doing, sir? You alright? I'm alright, mate. It's not that long since we last spoke. Uh, obviously, no, not did... really. 24 hours. But, it's, you know, it's exciting. Since we started Folk at Daft, this is something we've wanted to do is kind of basically, you know, ask the questions the fans want to get answered, really. Um, and it's brilliant. And thank you to the club. Thank you to John and Paul for giving up their time to, to offer the, the, themselves up, really, uh, and, and face questions. Because we know we love Folk at TV. We love Lewis and Stuart. But... Sometimes, you know, they don't get the time or the opportunity to ask the question they probably want to. So this this is a great platform to do it, Ross. Absolutely, yeah. No, I'm really excited to have them on. I think it's brilliant that they've uh, agreed to come on because let's face it, our patter can be chronic. So what, what have they let themselves in for? But I'm looking forward to it. I think this is going to be a good one. Slightly nervous? A wee bit. A wee bit. Because it I'm... is. It's like meeting the head. It's like getting brought up to the headmaster, eh? You know, and you... <laughs> <laughs> that, it's a wee bit like that. <laughs> You're just like, oh no. I'm, 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 I'm. So we'll see how it goes, but I'm really looking forward to the chat with John and Paul. But first of all, Ross, we have to thank our sponsors of this special show. Uh, that is Citrus Business Solutions. the big supporters of the club um, and the big supporters, Gordon and the guys over there. Uh, if you don't know what they do, they're an award-winning national company who deal in traditional ink and stationery to professional standard supplies, print, workwear and and office furniture. They are going to offer a complete service for all your workplace procurement needs. So you want to speak to the guys over at Citrus Business Solutions. As well as over 50 years of experience, Citrus are also committed to working towards a more sustainable future uh, by having zero landfill approach, supporting local charities, and also working with various suppliers to source eco-friendly alternatives to bags and drinkware. Uh, forget juggling different suppliers, partners, invoices and deliveries, all that sort of stuff. With Citrus Business Solution, you're going to benefit from a tailored support, smart spending, better value and an award-winning service every single time. So if you want a fresh way to buy for your business, check out Citrus Business Solutions as with over two years, 200 years, not just two years, 200 years of combined experience under their belts, they provide more than 40,000 essential office products and a suite of services to businesses all over the country. So if your business needs it, Citrus is going to sort it out for you. Get in touch with them right now. Citrus Business Solutions. You can get them on 01282 602 099. 01282 602 099. Or contact them. Dead easy to do. Tell them Falkirk Daft sent you. Speak to Gordon and the boys over there. Sales at citrusofficegroup.com. Sales at citrusofficegroup.com. Get in touch with them now. Sort out. Uh, all your stationery for your business, the guys will get it sorted for you over there. Is that not right, Ross? Absolutely perfect. Yep, absolutely. Uh, as we've obviously had Gordon on uh, as a guest pundit way back. I think. Yeah, we should point. But uh, God, Gordon is one of the the, the uh, club's patrons as well, and yeah, we spoke yeah. to him by one of the early episodes of Focus Daft. So yeah, it's Gordon's it. business. Get in touch with Gordon; he will sort you out. Now let's get to the main event, Ross. And welcome the current Falkirk management team. It's John McGuire and Paul Smith. Hi, gents. How are we? Good, thanks. How are you? Very good. Very good. Guys, thank you for joining us in Falkirk. Daft. really appreciate your time, especially with a big game ahead of us at the weekend. Um, let's just... Weekend. There's a big... Uh... <laughs> 
celebration coming as well because Paul turns 60 tomorrow. No way! November. So there's, there's a big celebration. Uh, birthday celebration. I know that's hard to believe. You'd, it's very hard to believe, Paul. You don't like 60. You don't <laughs> like 60. I remember when you were a 20-something running about Brockville, so that can't happen. <laughs> um, John, have you got a, a present for him? Yeah, he's been well looked after, yeah. <laughs> you are, good. Uh, got a nice cake for him today, and the boys have got a quick round and everything is going to be eating out for the next six months. Yeah. Oh, and nice. Players, the management staff, uh, directors, everybody else, commercial team at the club have, have done me proud. Oh, fantastic. Is that a call on the car power? <laughs> no, no. No. Lovely Falkirk cake. Lovely stuff. That's what I like to hear. Uh, well, happy birthday, Paul, when it, when it comes to the best birthday present, I guess, would be a victory against Dunfermline on Saturday, of course. Very much so. Um, it was great, obviously, to, to win on Saturday. I said that to the players. It was uh, great to win on Saturday. Good to have uh, the presents today. And, you know, final thing, it would be fantastic if, if we could go and get three points this coming Saturday. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. And just get into the questions, guys. I mean, you guys came in the uh, start of the summer. What attracted you to come to Falkirk in the first place? Yeah, the size of the club, really, and the potential that's here. And uh, it's in a situation that it's a sleeping giant. Uh, we all know that the club's much bigger than League One. Uh, and it was our job to try and get them out of League One, get them into the Championship and get pushing for, for Premiership. Uh, we know that it's not an easy job because if it had been easy, someone would have done it in the past three, three years, you know, and that's not been done. So there's a challenge there, you know, there's a big challenge there uh, to turn it around. We've been very pleased with what we've done so far, uh, but certainly it was the potential at the football club, you know, it's a Premiership football club. And we, you know, have... Won League One on a couple of occasions, and we have knocked on the door to, you know, get into the Premiership. So we feel like it's a realistic possibility that we could do that at this football club with the backing that they have, you know, from the fan base that they've got, uh, you know, and that that can create a hell of a lot of money. And then if you can reinvest that money wisely into the the playing staff, then hopefully we can we can keep everyone happy and we can ful fulfil our ambition. Yeah. I mean, you guys were obviously on the other side, you know, facing Falkirk, you know, as opposing uh, management team. Did, did you see problems on the, the pitch and you thought, well, we can come in and we can put our own stamp and our own philosophy onto that team? I think if we'd gone to any football club, not just Falkirk, we'd put our own, our own stamp, our own Call it DNA and our style, how we like to go and play and put our, um, you know, training methods in place. So, you know, it wouldn't matter if it had been Falkirk, we would have taken that with us. And obviously, as John touched on there, there have been previous, a few previous managements over the, the last three years that haven't been able to, to get back into the Championship. And that's all our aim now this season is to try and get back into the Championship. With, with being an ex-player, Paul, did you kind of have a, a word in the gaffers here and say, come on, we've got to go to Falkirk, we've got to give this a shot? We knew how big a club it was. You know, obviously... I had great times playing at Falkirk, you know, I think 18 months I was here um, at the old Brockville, great supporters, um, you know, big crowds going to the game there. So we, we knew ourselves how, how big a club this is. And as I say, it, just repeating myself here, you know, previous managers tried not got there. And, and as I say, we're, we're desperate to go and get the club back in the championship, build on there and take them as far as we can. What I guess it's a hard thing to do, but in a sentence, what is you guys' football philosophy? If you could sum it up, what would you, is your football philosophy? I like to see something that you can identify with, that you can actually recognise what we're trying to do. I like to see something that's pleasing on the eye. Uh, I like to see good football. Now, Paul, I've got my... Uh, vision of good football and what somebody else has could be two entirely different things but I like to see the ball passed you know it doesn't need to be passed any certain amount of passes it doesn't even need to be a, an exact number or even close to a number it's not about a number uh, it doesn't matter if it's two or three passes like we can do against Queen of the South out here when Nicky Hogarth gets the ball and he like uh, from a very very quick counter attack situation from a corner kick can find one you know 70% higher up the pitch 
to play the ball into Callum Morrison hits a screamer in the top bin and there's like one for Nicky and one pass for one to Callum and the ball's in the back end or another part, another phase of play where we maybe score 10 maybe after 10, 15 passes it, it doesn't really matter it's it's something that we've worked on we've worked on that what happened with uh, Nicky playing to to Juan and Juan to Callum uh, we've worked on that type of thing whether we get the finish like Callum had on that particular occasion all the time or not is like you know up for debate because no that's not the case however he hit that one very very sweetly so I like an attacking style of football uh, I like it to be fast I like it to be flowing and I think that's what we've been producing you know I think that's what the fans have seen more often than not it's not going to happen every every game unfortunately you know uh We'd want it to, but, you know, on certain days, you know, we're human beings and for some reason or other, it may not work. Uh, sometimes due to us, sometimes due to opposition. But I can, well, in my opinion, I can happily say that we've uh, we produced some really, really good entertaining performances so far and we look to get better at what we do. And I believe we can still do that. Uh, I feel we're still in a transitional period. So I like fast flowing football, attacking football, more or less on the ground, but it doesn't necessarily have to be because you've got to see the opportunity to exploit the opposition, to create a situation where you may have to get round them to score a goal. You might have to go over the top of them to score a goal. You may have to play through them to, to score a goal. So, and the more variety you have, the more difficult it is to predict what you're going to do and how more difficult it is for the opposition to, to stop you. And so I've got to have loads of different variations. You know, our movement is very good. More often than not, the opposition find difficulty with our movement and that's kind of like feedback from the opposition more often, again, than not with regards to trying to, to mark our players. So we have overlapping fullbacks, guys that can get up and do the pitch. You really want uh, strong central defenders. You want guys that are good in the ball. But they also need to be physically strong and they, they need to ideally have heights. You know, I'm going to say a big thing, you know, but you, you need height in your team, particularly for defending set plays. You will get teams who are very direct and if you can't deal with it, then that's going to cause you problems. You've got to be able to deal with, you know, opposition who are direct playing. And you're no doubt going to have to deal with long throws, corner kicks, free kicks, you know, all these type of things. And you need to have players in your team who are physical. The modern day game, more and more and more, and the higher up you go, the more it's about that. You know, there's always going to play, be a place for a, for a Messi. Of course there is. But you're not going to have a team in them, you know. So you're, there's always be a place, but the, the way things are going, the way I see things going, where I'm watching football... You know, uh, the Fiorentina team that played Hearts recently were all giants. You know, they're all, they're all giants. And uh, what they want is really good, good football players who are who are giants, you know. Uh, that's that's that, that's how I see the game as heading in that direction and going in that direction. Uh, but there'll always be an exception and there'll always be room for, you know, the smaller player who is nippier, sharper, uh, Sometimes difficult to mark, sometimes can lose it, but uh, the opposition. So that, that that that's what I like. That's that's what I like. That's what I like to see. I like to be able to go in a game, and identify what a team's playing, how they're playing, and I think the modern day fan does as well. I think the modern day fan is much more intelligent than previously. And I've I've said this before. I've done other podcasts, particularly with Graham Spears, and went over it. You know, the the years going back from the start of Sky where. Richard Keyes and Andy Gray and going up and attack this board coming out and the armchair fan even learning more and more about the game because of the go over it and now you've got uh, Carragher and, and, and Gary Neville who on their Monday night football go over the games at the weekend and they've got all their uh, you know their, their uh, whiteboard type thing with their tactics and everything else I think fans are wanting more than just somebody lumping the ball the park and it's like yeah. a game of chance you know you might get you know, you know, I work with Brendan Rogers, and basically his philosophy: you just kick the ball up. It's all, all that's happening is it's coming back quicker. 
you know, if you just launch out the park, all that's happening is it's coming back even quicker, you know. So you you like to try and control games. Now, again, there's another 11 players out there trying to prevent you from controlling games and trying to put their way they play onto you. And there's no right, there's no wrong. It's what works. But you're asking me what I like, and that's what I like, and that's how I like my teams to play. And I get, give them credit to fans who, you know, uh, all different types of fans who, some will like that, some will not. But that's that's the nature, and that's the nature. You have to un- understand that, you know. But we have to, you know, when we get chatting with the directors, you know, they're looking, they've like to think that they've chosen ourselves because we have, well, we've won the league a couple of times. We are very experienced and they've seen the type of football the teams that we've had have been credited with playing particularly good football dare I say it you know silky soccer you know so yeah when we're those teams that are like kind of high scoring at the moment now we've scored 25 goals we're joint top with a few others and you guys watching it and the fans listening to this you know we could easily add oh, how many goals could we add to that you know, chances that yeah, the chances yeah. that we've we missed you know and I appreciate every team in the league can say that but I think we could say that most definitely you know so we could have scored dumpteen goals uh, you know, I, I mean I've obviously chatted here for so long that you might not get it in our question in I've been, <laughs> Oh, no, John, I think you've 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 almost answered the next question to be honest. However, I think you're right. I think the fans have noticed a massive, massive change of culture in terms of the, the style of play. And you're right, sometimes it does have to be mixed up a bit depending on who you're playing or how a game's going. But I think the fans and we, we obviously we don't speak for all the fans, but I think the fans that we have coming on as guest pundits and stuff every Monday night, they they talk about the the calibre of football we're playing and in the most it is night and day compared to the last few years, if not even longer. So we thank you for that. You mentioned about your philosophy, though. So that was going to be my next sort of question. Um, you mentioned Brendan Rodgers there. Has he been the sort of biggest influence in your management style? Well, in recent years, but I think you've got to go back a little bit further because I was very fortunate because there was another couple of sort of Falkirk legends that gave me an opportunity to get in the game with Jim Jeffries and Billy Brown. You know, when they left Falkirk to go to Hearts, they allowed me to go into Hearts under 16 level. And I worked there for 11 years and made my way up when, uh, when Paul Hegarty went to Aberdeen, Peter Houston went into moving up from the Hearts uh, under 18 coach into the first team coach. And I got an opportunity then to go full time with, with, with Hearts under 18 level. And so, I learned a lot from Jim and Billy, you know, I learned a lot from them. And then Craig Levine came in and I, I learned a, a, an awful lot from Craig Levine. So there's four years there between 2000 and 2004 when I learned a lot under under Craig. But, you know, to this day, I'll always thank Jim and Billy for, you know, allowing me the, that opportunity and the chance and learning from them so much and their work ethic to the game. I mean, Jim and Billy, you know, we'd leave training on a Tuesday and we'd go down south to watch reserve games and, and all, all sorts of games done in England and they done it when they were here as well and it's the only way that you can have fine players and you know you, you buy into that habit and I know that like say uh, other people of you know, like John Hughes and uh, Brian Rice they, they learned that from, from them as well and they, they took it on so they were a big influence in, in what I did you know after Craig we had some you know, George Burley uh, John Robertson a very very small time at Hearts, just a few months really, and then uh, George Burley came in, who again learned a, a lot from from George Burley uh, he had a really, really good successful time at, at Hearts, albeit very short, and then uh, Graham Ricks came in, and then some foreign coaches uh, Valdas Ivanouskas, uh, Edward Malafif, before I got the chance to manage myself at, at, at Wraith Rovers, so yeah, learn a lot all the time, and then you've got to stand on your own two feet and, and learn, your, learn your own way. So, I had a, a great apprenticeship and a great sort of education before you got the, the opportunity to, to go and manage myself and then, you know, stand on your own two feet. And then, obviously, that's where, you know, Paul comes in. We've been together from the best, from the most of, you know, initially Gary Kirk was there, but Gary then went to London United with Craig as well. And Donald Park was in for a very, very short period. And then, then, then Paul came in, Smodger came in, and then we've been together, you know, more or less, with the exception of the period where uh, I went to Hearts and then 
go back to Harris's manager, a period at uh, Livingston yeah. and before working at Celtic. So when you move into Celtic, I was initially working as a scout under John Park on the scouting, but then when Brian Rogers came in, I ended up doing the opposition analysis. And yes, in that period, I would probably say that I've learned the mu- much more of tactically, much more tactically, uh, and the people he worked with and people he had around him that you learn from. And uh, yeah, without doubt, you know, the way we play is more that we've learned from working at Celtic and working with the people that, you know, Brendan Rogers, Chris Davis, John Kennedy, Kolo Toure, you know, you can go on and on and on, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it was a, a, you know, you try to translate that into, when I go back to the throwers, you're trying to put that into place with the players you've got. And then when you come here, the same. Because we, we were, we've got plenty of plaudits for the, the style of football that we, that we you know, played. And, you know, in the, in the very short term we've been here, that seems to be the case again. So we're, we're obviously getting a message across. The players, you know, enjoy playing in it. We enjoy seeing them play good football. And ideally, it's we're getting goals as well. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I think for, for myself on that one, it's very much the same learning of previous managers. Obviously, I worked under Jim McLean and Tommy McLean, who uh, tactically probably Jim McLean. I was only at Dundee United for maybe eight months. But at that time, he was probably way ahead of the game with, you know, most of their coaches at that time, working with Jockey Scott. So, you know, a hell of a lot of good managers I've worked under. And then you go the other way and you're working with, with Jim Leachman and you learn a man management skill, how to deal with players, to get the best out of players as well. And John's obviously touched on the the, the tactical side with, with Brendan Rodgers and we have certainly moved with the times. And I have to say, I've, I've learned so much off of John and, uh, you know, working over the last four years as well with what he's picked up from his time at Celtic. Yep. I mean, you guys are two guys that obviously live and breathe football and, you know, talk about the philosophy. When you come into a, a club like Falkirk, um, with this kind of philosophy and how to, you want to see the game played, you know, and we've obviously struggled the last couple of seasons, how easy or how hard was it to, to bring that into the club and also to get the players to kind of stick to that? Well, the first thing is recruitment. You know, that was the first thing we had to do. We started to recruit players, you know. We had 13, 14 players under contract. So, of course, that tied up a fair chunk of budget, you know. So, we only had X amount of money to then reinvest into the football club. And we immediately, you know, felt that we need to get stronger in the central defence, you know. We, we felt we needed to do that. Uh, and that's where, you know, bringing in call and, and Hendo, uh, Liam Henderson, into, into the squad. So that was the first thing, was bringing in players. Plus the fact they players will take the ball, they want the ball, they'll pass the ball, they're good football players. Uh, I worked with Cole Donaldson when he was like 18 at, at Livingston, and he got a move to, to Queen's Park Rangers. And way back then, before me, you know, John uh, Hughes and John Collins were coaches at Livingston uh, when Cole was even coming through when he was younger. So he was brought up by passing the ball uh, from the back, taking the ball and building the game. And we, I knew that by bringing Cole, we don't we have someone who is very much wanting to do that. Liam Henderson, yeah, again, is a, is a very, very comfortable on the ball. Great range of pass. You know, we've seen the passing that he can, he can do. But they're both like six feet three. They're both very physically strong. They're both... You know, I mean, Cole's got, uh, I don't know how many appearances he's got under his belt. He's played in the Premiership, you know, uh, in Scotland, obviously, uh, even up until, you know, a year ago with, with Ross County before he, he went and wrote to Dunfermline in the second half of the season. So, like, bags and bags of experience. Uh, Liam was part of a very successful, you know, albeit just missed out our growth team last year. Uh, so, trying to, to get players in who were going to, play the way we, we wanted to, but at the same time be like good defenders and physically strong players that we've, that we've mentioned. And uh, again, that was a, another good reason towards the end of our uh, time at Wraith Rovers, they were brought in Sean Mackey around about February, uh, January, January, end of January, February, because he played in the Scottish Cup tie against Celtic. Uh, you know, and we, and we liked the way that Sean played as a, as a, as a left back and we felt, you know, 
that we need to strengthen in that area as well. And so, you know, immediately trying to get that. I mean, the goalkeeper, we have to do something on the goalkeeping front as well. So that's where the PGA comes in. So everything I can go through now, I can, we can talk to 10 o'clock tonight about how, how many players we brought in, why we brought them in, what we did. You know, uh, Stephen McGinn, obviously that influence, that, that winning mentality that he goes and wins a league with Kilmarnock last year. We need somebody who's, you know, got great experience in the game. Uh, both for on the pitch and off the pitch, you know, and a winner, uh, and having an influence, a good influence on the younger players as well, because we, we are actually quite a young squad. You know, we are, we are a young squad. Uh, we have obviously got a lot of the players there who were there. The player, the, the players that were there, are technically good football players. A lot of them are technically good football players. No doubt, it's not for me because I don't really worry about the past. But probably I think it would have been said that too many of the same types of players, you know. But with the style of football we're playing, they can play it. They can get into it and they can just get a little bit of confidence going. And allied to the players we've just mentioned, the backbone of the team, then it can work. It can work because I don't believe anyone who likes playing football wouldn't want to play the way we play. You know, uh, and so the guys will want to, they do, they want to play, they want, they want to play. Uh, and so, and by that, I mean, they want to play football, you know, and they enjoy that, you know. Uh, and again, there's no right, there's no wrong, but it's, you know, it's, if you can identify something and uh, it's good in the eye, then for me, that's, that, that's, that ticks boxes. And the players, uh, the, the, the players who are there, like Aidan Nesbitt, Callum Morrison, Craig McGuffey, uh, these guys, Steve Etherington, you know, they've all kind of like Ryan Williamson, unfortunately, but Ryan's been injured for a while, but he just, you know, probably had his best game uh, that day against Peter Edden and get picks up an injury. Liam McCann is, is, is like kicked on. Well, I, I don't know, but I see him playing particularly well. Uh, Brad, starting the season well, picked up an injury, he's got to sell back in and now. Young Finn Yates, we all were raving about him when he first came on the scene. And for a young boy of his age to play so many consecutive games, is outstanding, absolutely outstanding. Oh, wow. and yeah, phenomenal. The loan deals that were brought in between Juan and then, uh, well, Romano's not a loan deal, Romano's our, Kenny, our, our player, uh, bringing in Kai Kennedy in, again, Kai came in, immediately got a hernia, had to get a hernia operation, so he took a wee while to get going. Now you see him, you know, what he can bring to the team. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're find, finding ourselves with a very, very strong squad. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you guys, you must have, you go home to the wife's at, at night. Um, how do you relax? Because, it, it, like I say, just listen to you there, John, listen to you, how you, you just, it seems you just want to talk about football all the time. Just get home at night and the wife's just go, go and just shut up for a minute. How, how do you guys relax when you get in the door at night? You wouldn't believe it, actually. <laughs> go on, John, go on. The first thing you do is take your laptop out. <laughs> Start looking at football. Is that, to, is that to watch the Falkirk Daft podcast, I assume, John? <laughs> we, don't, uh, we don't do so, social media. So we keep away from the social media side of things. So that's no, certainly one thing we won't be watching. <laughs> she's probably going, what a boring sod you are. You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, my wife, and you know, obviously been married some considerable amount of time so uh, she's just used to it you know, just used to it but uh, more or less laptop comes out and you're maybe looking at the game for the last weekend you're maybe looking at your op opposition that you're going to uh, be playing this this weekend and uh, starting to organise the training for the next again day you know alright so it's not completely full on but that's not a million miles away from it either you know and like you know tonight there's Champions League football what else are you going to do <laughs> Oh, exactly. so, so you don't watch Strictly on a Saturday night, John. That's what we're getting at there, no? No, it's even one of those when you, you wake up at half two, three o'clock in the morning, especially, you know, if, if, if you've had a bad result and you're going over the game, John probably gets up and watches on the laptop at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's always going through your head, you know, what we did well, what we didn't do well. So it's always there or there, thereabout. 
Do you know, it's interesting you've actually said that, Paul, because that we, we've we joked previously about if we've maybe not had a, a, a good win or a, mm. or a convincing performance at the weekend. We've actually joked on the podcast saying, I bet you John was up at three in the morning, four in the morning, dissecting mm. where it's kind of went. And obviously you've just confirmed that. So Well, yeah. you, you do. You, you wake up, you know, sometimes you have your best ideas in the middle of the night. So, you, you know, you, you wake up with the different things uh, going through your mind to be a, a good performance, which usually if you've had a poor performance, yeah, it's you're up there to sleep and you're up uh, trying to say dissect things. Yeah. Yes, it's no joke, that's for sure. I can remember <laughs> years and years ago, uh, probably showing a bit of time, but like uh, you used to kid on, you know, we we're kind of like backroom staff and the guys that we, yeah. you know, if a Saturday night, if we got a bad result, then the message was watching Pop Idol and I was upstairs on the laptop or vice versa. <laughs> no. And that's that was the size of it. So you're watching Pop Idol and I would be like, no chance, <laughs> come in. <laughs> you know, you mentioned Strictly now, I'm not into Strictly at all, but Popeye, your X Factor, and the voice, maybe, eh? <laughs> <laughs> superb, superb. That's, that's interesting you've talked about the weekend. So obviously the fans get to see you guys um, on a Saturday afternoon. We hear from you during the week as well. But what does a, what was it, what does a typical non-match day look for John and Paul? What, what happens at the stadium? Oh, like a, a, a training day. Yeah, yeah. A training day. Training week, we'll, we'll come in on a, obviously, Sunday off, we'll play the game on a Saturday, have a good result. Come in uh, on the Monday, we'll, Gaffer will do about uh, 20, 25 minutes video analysis. Please, Steve McKay. Uh, and then obviously, we'll, we'll split, usually on a Monday, we'll split into two, two groups, do a wee recovery session with the, the 10 that played, and then the rest of the guys, maybe depending on the numbers, 10, 11, We'll go and train these guys on a Monday, right. and then you know Tuesday we come together and train together on the, on the Tuesday, and it's just a, a gradual build up. Thursday, Friday, getting preparing for the game uh, on on the Saturday. And do you guys tend to pick the team, as in sort of tell the team what the starting lineup is earlier? Sorry, not earlier in the week, but Thursday and Friday to get them into that mindset as well. More often than not, they're going to have a right good idea, you know. Uh, all bar one this season, we've uh, virtually named the team on a Friday, sometimes you'll get a right good idea by the Thursday, but as I say, bar on one occasion, we've virtually named the team on a on a Friday. Yeah, we, we go over our set plays that we're going to do uh, on the Saturday, and that's a dead giveaway as to the team on, you know, on the Friday, when we do it on the Friday, yeah. it's basically the team is going to go out. Barring players picking up you know, COVID overnight and uh, bits and pieces, which happened, and you know, Big Ryan picked up COVID. Edinburgh uh, City. Uh, Edinburgh City, doing it Morton, there was something happened, doing it Morton overnight in the very, very first game. You know, uh, I think it was, it was it Stevie Hellington that missed, somebody else missed it in a game. that. Uh, so, yeah, Baron, and that, we actually had that happening quite a number of times, actually, early in the season, we kind of got everything prepared, planned, Team lines done, and then you know there was some mishaps, yeah. which you know we've had over like everyone's had over the last couple of years with, with, with COVID and the likes, you know. Yeah. yeah, I mean the team seems to have been picking itself, John. Obviously, you know keeping that one in team going. Um, you made some changes, obviously, there at the weekend, which worked out great result there at the weekend. I'm sure the the two boys, the the headache you've got is between Allegria and, and Burrow up front because both have been fantastic in, in very different ways. Yeah, absolutely. We have great competition in the squad now, actually, you know, uh, which is fantastic. It's a great problem for myself and Paul to have uh, when we've got so many players available, you know, and competing very well every day in training. So we need to take into consideration the forum and when you're winning, it's fairly straightforward if you've got the same players available to you if you're playing well then it's you know, there was a consistency when we were, we were like after Dunfermline game we bounced back from the defeat to Kelty we had good performance against Dunfermline and Dunfermline and then we went on a, on a, on a good run there where uh, you know we're winning winning games and scoring goals and so for that point of view we you know you do want to keep that going and there's no real need to change that and uh, and I, I understand, uh, you know, there are others, but more like you're talking about your Chelsea's and your Man City's and your Liverpool's, guys who are playing and maybe even, you know, your, your Celtic Rangers and they're talking about rotation when 
teams and players are Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, you know, over a, a lengthy period of time where that is going to, you know, tax your squad without doubt, you know, but we only play the odd midweek game. Uh, and so because of that, I don't think we really need it necessarily. And if we were playing to, if we were, if we were saying to players, well, we're going to start rotating around, you know, just to keep everyone happy. You know, if you're playing great, you want to be in the team. You didn't necessarily want to be like taken out, you know. So we kind of like put the ground rules in right at the start with regards to, you know, if you're playing well in a team that's winning, you know, then and you're available, then, you know, we will, we will we'll go down that road. And, and we've always kind of done that. And everyone really knows where they stand. And we've now got great competition, great competition uh, in midfield. I mean, we can... You know, like Liam Henderson is a very versatile player and that he can play centre back. At Dundee, we used him as a centre midfield role. He could go in and play at left back if needed to be. Dick Campbell actually played him at wide left, so he could actually go and play there. Uh, so that's great. You know, that's great. You know, we've had to play Finn Yates at right back. Now, we went on loan last year in the Highway League and played right back, but it's still quite a big step up to play in League One at right, at right back. But he He's acquitted himself really well because obviously Ryan went out and really only got the one natural right back. So in the last few games, felt that, you know, said earlier how well Finn has done, but for a young boy to play nearly every minute every game for about 16, 17 games, you probably need a little a little break. And like Brad had come back from injury, was knocking on the door, comes in, you know, again, like you said there about the, the, the Saturday, can he work? Well, can he work when Brad scores the first goal against Aloha that night? Yeah. And so Brad's, you know, uh, give us a, another dimension with regards to we've got somebody else who's very, very good in the opposition box with regards to, you know, creating goals, creating chances, at the same time good in our box for defending set plays. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of competition. And even in midfield, you know, we had, we had a bounce game last Monday night and the boys did really, really well. And Steve Harrington played, Ola played. Seb Ross played, they all done particularly well. Sean Mackey played, he played great, you know. And so we were, we have, we've got about 20 players who are really in form. We had a dis- disappointing game against Kelly. Yeah, we changed it at half time. And there's no point in having competition for places if you're just going to stick with the same thing all the time. And, and it didn't go right. We need to give one or two a, a little wake up call that, you know, it's not just a Marty coming in and just taking the jersey. So, yeah, there was a couple of changes and it's up to the players then to to grasp that opportunity, which, you know, by all accounts, they did. And so the players all know where the sort of the guidelines are and what they need to do. And all I can say is they're working extremely hard and they're, they're working hard for each other. They're working hard for the club. They're working hard for the jersey. More often than not, we'll produce really, really good performances and uh, they're breathing down each other's necks to, to try and get in that team because they're, they're actually enjoying doing what they're doing but they want to play a part, you know, then they just want to come on for like 15, 20 minutes. They want to play longer. Yeah. But we can only get a living on the park and, uh, you know, when we win, we've got it right and when we don't win, we've not got it right and that's that's football. Thanks, John. We're well, yeah. real happy changing them to say the boys love coming into their work, love coming into training every day and it's a, it's a great group of players we've got, you know, they got on really well together um, and, and that all helps. You know, if you've got a happy changing room, it makes our, our job by uh, health a lot easier. I think you can tell in the park as well because you know we've it's what we've been missing. I think you know having suffered the last few seasons, it's you can just see that there's a real spirit on that park um, and real leadership on that park as well because it's another thing we've probably been missing on the field in the last few seasons. I think that's something that you know when we came in, John spoke about recruitment, and that's. Uh, Exactly the type of players we want to bring in. Obviously, the Cole Donaldsons, the Liam Hendersons, and McGinn with his experience. You know, real characters about the place as well. They're fantastic in the changing room. And as John mentioned, you know, we, we let them police that changing room themselves. And uh, Steve McGinn's obviously a, a big leader in there. Paul, see, just because uh, I know John's probably got another couple of questions to go, but I think, see, one thing you mentioned there about the atmosphere on the pitch, it's actually translated to the stands as well because you feel it in the stands now. Um, from kickoff, but even then, when it's not going to plan, like the Kelly game you mentioned at halftime, like I, 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 I genuinely have no idea how we didn't 
actually turn that game around and win it or, or get the draw because the crowd were up for it, the players were up for it. There was that proper sense of unity again that we've been missing for a long time, you know. Yeah, and that, again, that comes from the, the players in the park. As I say, I was at a couple of games, Falkirk games last year, and, and the atmosphere wasn't great about no. the stadium. No. Uh, but certainly the fans have been absolutely fantastic. The way fans have been, uh, as usual, the way fans are always the, the best. When they, obviously, when they're away from home, they, they've been absolutely fantastic. The home crowd are starting, as I say, really really get behind the team as well. And it, it makes such a difference when you've got positivity all around the stadium. Yeah. Um, I felt, you know, Fair enough, we got a wee bit stick when we came off half time against Kelty, but they came, they saw what the players reacted uh, in the second half, and they were very positive uh, right up to the final whistle there. Well, we, we sit right behind the home dugout, and I don't want to pitch him out, but it was definitely John having a go. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> yeah, just thought I'd say that. Uh... <laughs> um, yeah. It's so... not something that you want to be. Uh be doing too often or anything like that you know but it wasn't good enough so you, you, sometimes you've just got to uh, actually speak louder than words you just got to try and so we made some changes and we changed the style you know uh, which isn't easy to do it's not easy to do that I was going to say John I, I mean there was a, a notable change in, in the style kind of yeah. through, through the game Was it, did that kind of go against what you want to do but you just thought you know, we need to take them on, and we need to we need to do something drastic here. Absolutely, one hundred percent, exactly. It's not the way that we we want to play. Uh, so, but I going back, it doesn't matter how we score goals. We score two goals to set plays, scruffy type goals, but you know they all, they all count, and so that's important. And it maybe could have got us a, a, a point in the day. You know, uh, maybe a win if we'd got that equaliser earlier, but obviously it didn't come at all. But yeah, I think the, the changes uh, and playing a bit more direct. So I've said this in the interview uh, on Friday, which lasted 60 minutes, I've been told, that uh, when you've got a DNA and when you've got a way of playing, teams can set up to play against that. And obviously we need to do what we do better to come combat that. But when you actually go, like we went route one for the opposition, well, they're not used to doing that. They weren't ready for that. They're not saying ready for it. But we're still going home. We're dealing with something different now, you know, because both Juan and Romarin, they're two very, very strong boys. They're both, you know, good runners and they're both physically strong. You know, you, 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 you won't knock them about. And so when we went with the two up and we played very a little bit narrower in midfield, three players in behind that, they became a direct style up on the ball. And Barron, you know, losing that stupid, like, third goal, you know, I think, well, you know, I think we could, two one and very much on top. You know, we would have, we would have got something out of that game. We hadn't lost that. You know, really, really like soft, soft, blinking third goal. You know, so yeah, we had to change. It's not something you would want to be doing too often. Uh, but horses for courses and getting a reaction uh, was very much the way about it on that particular occasion. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a big question would be, we put this out on our, our Twitter, or a big question was asked, do you think there'd be, if we're pushing for promotion uh, come January, do you think there'll be room to manoeuvre in the in the transfer window? I mean, you're obviously really happy with the squad, and there's, like you said, lots of competition for places. I think the one place that would probably, you talked about Finn Yates moving over to right back, we've got Brad Mackay in there at the moment, do you think there's maybe room to manoeuvre, maybe bring in a right back come January? Well, we're always looking, uh, you know, we get, we've got Alan Fraser as our uh, sort of head of recruitment, uh, chief scout, whatever you, you want, to, want to call him. And, uh, you know, what a work he does. What a work he does. A lot of the work Alan is doing is obviously local stuff, Scottish games, but he's down in England watching under 23 games as well. A lot of the work he's doing will stand us in good stead, maybe not just right now, but maybe in the... the you know, the second year, hopefully the third year going forward when we leak one in, in Scotland is not getting recognised particularly well in, in England. I'm not saying not at all, but it's a little bit of an ask for some of the bigger clubs in England to put their players into League One. There'll, there'll be one or two here and there, but they're not a lot. Championship is an easier sell. It's more attractive. And obviously Premiership, yeah, it's, it's no problem whatsoever. So yes, so Alan's doing a lot of work, a hell of a lot of work. Uh, and obviously there's 
players that we know about and there's be potential loan deals from other clubs, you know, and from the Premiership. So that's a possibility. Everything will come down to to money. You know, money, money is the big thing. We we can produce players absolutely no problem. It will be money and how you know there's a going to be a massive crowd here on Saturday, which is going to obviously create you know good finance coming in. And the more fans that come to the games, the better. If we're playing attractive football, scoring goals and winning games, then you know this is the reason why we came because it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's going to generate more money. And that will give us a, a chance to bolster the squad. You know, bring players to the to the team. You know. Uh, you know, when I say both, I don't just mean just numbers. If you know, if you bring in players in, you really hope that you're going to bring in players that are going to uh, make us better. You know, so and we don't really want to do that by bringing in players that would do that and make us better. So yes, I mean, I'd be disappointed if if we don't. You know, I'd be really disappointed if we don't because we always try to heal and deal. You know, uh, and that's what we did. That no, as I say, that was the very first job when we. We're given the reins, you know, it was like, well, it's, 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 you know, it's the end of May. It's time where players are all available. The January window is a completely different window from, you know, the summer window when there's a lot of free agents, a lot of guys are moving clubs and you've got a lot of choice. The January window is not great. Uh, never is great. Uh, and you've got to be very selective. But hopefully there's a little bit of manoeuvrement for, for wheeling and dealing. I think, so I think it's always good to bring a fresh face in fresh face in or two uh, just to give us all that little bit push and I think the fans like to see that as well so fingers crossed we can do that you know I say we'll always produce players we'll always get players you know what we need is somebody to say like there's X amount you know so a few a few home sellouts between now and January would be helpful then. I would think so yes yeah. So obviously, John, you mentioned Saturday there, so it's obviously it's the big one. It's the Kincardine Bridge Derby. It seems to be labelled as in the modern day. Um, it's heading for a sellout, just as you mentioned, uh, which is going to be absolutely amazing. Um, how did the match at East End Park uh, earlier this season compare to sort of previous games uh, that you, you, you played against Dunfermline with Wraith and all the other teams? I think with a, a spell at Wraith, John, I think we were unbeaten in, was it eight games? So much of I mean, not quite as much as that, but no, well, we did fairly well against them firmly at the time. Yeah. Um, obviously, the last, the very last time, the, the last game against them firmly, they did beat us. We're, we're eighth, but we'd obviously won the Challenge Cup on the Sunday and we were a wee bit tired on the on the Wednesday for that game. But no, we've always had good games against them. Uh, going back to Moan time here at, at Brockville and at uh, East End Park, they're, they're always great, great games to play in. Uh, obviously, played in the a 4 0 win with Falkirk and a 4 0 uh, defeat with Dunfermline for Falkirk at, uh, I think they call it Super Tuesday. Indeed. So, I remember it well. Uh, mm-hmm. Great games, great atmosphere, uh, and a, a good occasion. As you say, the, the fans are coming out in their numbers, and uh, hopefully we can go and put on a good performance and, and get the three points. Well, no no pressure, guys, but my prediction on the episode that we did last night was, was a 4 0 home win and a Super Saturday was the chat. So. <laughs> No pressure at all. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we've got to, they've got to do it for Paul's sixtieth as well. You know, the boys have got to do it for the sixtieth. Um, John, you mentioned um, it took you sixteen minutes to do the interview last Friday. We thought we'd finish off the interview with some quick fire questions, if that's okay with you. We'll see. On you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Let's go. Who's good cop and bad cop between the two of you? It's a mixture. Good cop, good cop, bad cop, bad cop. Depends. Yeah, it's a mixture. Depends yeah. what day you get us on. It's a mixture. Yeah. Depends on the day. <laughs> yeah, we both go on us to be either or, to be honest with you. Yeah. Do, you have a, do you have a chat beforehand, like like the good cop is a bad cop? Right, you're bad cop today, I'm good cop. No. Nah, it's, oh. really, it's natural. What you see is what you get. I, I take it after Kelly was bad cop, bad cop then. No, nah, I... Aye, for at least about a week. <laughs> well, we we think we heard you at half time, so I can imagine what after the game was like as well. <laughs> How embarrassing is that? <laughs> um, hardest trainer in the squad. Erin Robertson to reception, please. Erin Robertson. Well, training is a difficult one. Eh? That's a difficult one. Uh, 
Aidan Nesbitt runs the furthest in games. Right. He runs the furthest in games. He's more often 13K, regular, wow. regular in 13K. Wow. High speed running. Callum Morris is very good with a high speed running. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've got a great group for training. And it, it's probably impossible to go and pick one player out as the best trainer because they've all yeah. got different strengths and, and weaknesses and that. And as I say, they they work hard really every day. So very yeah. difficult just to go and pick one body out of that one. Yeah. Yeah. Who's the dressing room joker? We've got a few. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Donaldson is oh, I wouldn't really be married to him he's just moans all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's up to the dodges Paul Watson's cute he's one to watch he's one to watch he's quiet but yeah a fox a fox Hendo's like just a daft boy yeah, yeah. but I can you joker I joker yeah yeah absolutely yeah Okay. They're, 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 they're the yeah. main characters as was, as Paul related to just there a little bit earlier on there. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. But they're good characters as well though. You know, they're good characters. You know, they're they're they are a bit boyish and uh, they, they are, you know, the young men. And uh well they like their darts as well. They like their wee game of darts. It kind of keeps them kind of like happy uh, in the dressing room before training and after training, you know. Uh so fair enough, whatever keeps them happy. Uh, but they're, they're the kind of they're, they're the, the jokers and the loudest in the dressing room. Right. Um, other than yourselves, because we know how snappy you both are, who's the best and worst dressers in the changing room? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking two 60 year olds. I've seen one come out with some dodgy, uh, some uh, dodgy tracksuits. Well, I've seen them on Instagram. I have seen a few uh, get-ups. The worst dresser, but uh, he's colourful. Let's say, yeah, yeah. colourful. Yeah, yeah. It, it might actually be the best gear in the yeah. in the dressing room, but he's colourful <laughs> without doubt. We it's actually were well, a wee bit disappointed. Jeez, I've not got the caps on uh, today, <laughs> gents, because obviously well, that's indoors. The, we're indoors. Yeah. That's that's the the thing, and I, I even got my cap out ready just in right. case. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be changing the really hot shortly when the weather uh, when the weather gets worse. The really, really hot will come on for me. The weather was good for so long. I've got to protect the building upper. You know, I've got oh. factor fifty on and a cap. <laughs> I can't get the building upper burn. Um, who's who's the teacher's pet? Who's that player that's leaving behind an apple, going, you know, hanging about in the training ground afterwards, coming up to you, going, "Did I play well today, Gaffer?" Who's the teacher's pet? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that'll go doing too well. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah. Taking the fifth on that one, John. Yeah, there's one. <laughs> we know there's one there, though. I didn't know you coming to my garden last week, so maybe I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> right, there you go. Uh, no, right. And uh, I think yeah, we've got time... Go near us. <laughs> I think we've got uh I think we've got time for at least one more, I think, John, haven't we? Um, yeah. So who in, who in the squad would make a good manager in the future, do you think? I would say Stephen McGinn. Probably, probably is the one that's closest to doing that type of thing, you know, being like his age and uh, being probably the most senior player in the in the squad. Uh, he's probably the one who's closest to doing that. Mm. But I think his background is like football, football, football. The family he's come from, they're all football, football daft, you know. And you can only really see him going either that or into punditry. You know, I think he does a little bit on Radio Clyde and that, and bit, little bits and pieces for the BBC. So, but I think you could see Steve McGinn going into coaching and then management further down the line. He takes a great interest in the, the analysis that we do, uh, like most of them do. But I think he pays, you know, even more more attention than than someone's got. A, and I, a, you know, a more mature and more experienced uh, eye eye of the game. Yeah, probably what he's probably worked with a lot of different managers as well, and come across a, a hell of a lot. He's been to a few clubs, you know. So we know who the teacher's pet is as well now. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, listen, thank you so much for joining us in Falk Daft. You didn't have to do that and we really, really appreciate your time because we've obviously got that big game on Saturday. Have you got any kind of final message for the supporters out there? Keep supporting us. You know, the backing has been fantastic. Home and away, absolutely. Big, big, big numbers at home. 3-7, 3-8. Obviously, we're looking at 7,000 already for 
and this is like Tuesday where Unbelievable. we are. Unbelievable. League one not, game. Not going out to Thursday, but you know, seven thousand already sold and it's only it's only Tuesday. So this game is always going to catch your imagination, but I think the fact that the two teams are going so well, we respect Dunferman, Dunferman the team at the top of the league. You know, we want to try and cut into that four point gap there is right now. I don't think any quarter will be asked or given at the weekend. I think both both teams are going to go for it and give everything they've got to get the points for their prospective club. And obviously, we are looking to... thought the game at East End Park was a great game. Uh, we're hoping it's everybody's good with us coming out on top. Brilliant. John McGuinn, Paul Smith, thank you so much for coming on Folk at Daft. Come on Saturday. Thanks, yeah, guys. Absolutely. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. This is Falkirk Daft. So there you have it, Ross, uh, John McGuinn and Paul Smith. I have to say, I'm feeling drained after that because I was just like, right, if I say the wrong thing here, he is going to find me in the stands on Saturday and probably batter me. Yeah, well, he now knows where we sit as well. Oh, well, well done for that, Ross. <laughs> Great. Well done. Oh, we just sit behind you in the dugout, John. Oh, he's going to... Well, if he hears it, he go, he's going to hear this go out. In fact, he doesn't do social media, so he won't, no, he won't tag him on anything. Like but um, I, he's going to find us and seek us out and bat, basically batter me. Thanks for that, Ross. Really I know, I did, I did throw you in it. Uh... Uh, I was it was he mean it was slagging it at Kel I was saying a couple of things, but I didn't aim anything at the manager. It was all the players. Honest, honest John, if you're oh, listening. No, I, I, yeah, exactly. It was the players for, it was the players who were uh, Exactly. But no, no, some really interesting points. I think the most interesting point we've got from it is that uh, John McGuinn is not a fan of Strictly and prefers Pop Idol in the X Factor. Exactly. Well, I don't think that's a shock to me. I, th- I thought he was a pop idol kind of guy. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, you can tell like the, the two of them and, you know, when we talked about the, the live and the breathe football, you know, and it is, it's it's that manager that we've been needing and I think we'll agree since Hoosty is that, you know, established old school and now... We, we, I'm not saying John's old school because you can hear his philosophy and how it's changed working with Brendan Rodgers and, and just taking everything on board. He's t- got an old school philosophy, but a new philosophy, if that makes any sense. No, old school mentality, make... new school yeah, philosophy. Yeah, hard work, but with a modern approach on it. You could tell he, he, you know he doesn't... Doesn't he like anyone mean... short, by the way? <laughs> no, no, he doesn't. Uh, well, however, he obviously, because he mentioned Liam McCann's been playing at his skin, which is great to, to hear him yeah. say that, because obviously... There was a lot of rumours that Leon wasn't fancied, and then I suppose you you, you put the, the signing of Mackie in there as well. But actually, he's made left back his yeah. own now. Yeah. And undroppable. Mackie can't even get in the, the, the team just now. So yeah. Um, yeah. No, listen, I, I thought that was brilliant. Um, big massive thank you to the pair of them for coming on. And um I think you and I both thought, oh, they're not gonna come on. And then they've came on. So that's been brilliant. Big shout out to to, to Gordon and the guys at Citrus Business Solutions as well for sponsoring the, the, the show tonight as well. Yeah, if you want a fresh way to buy for your business, check out Citrus Business Solutions. Uh, 200 years of combined experience under their belts will provide more than 40,000 essential office products and a suite of services to businesses all over the country. And as we say, get in touch with Gordon. You can give him a call 01282 602 099 or get him at sales at citrusofficegroup.com. Thank you very much for listening to the first uh, Falkirk Daft Meets. Hopefully we can do a couple more. I quite fancy it now. Yeah, I quite fancy it. Yeah, we you know, all I think look, a couple yeah. of ex-players maybe we get on. I know a couple of them we could maybe uh, get on. So maybe maybe do some more of these. I quite enjoyed that, yeah, um, okay. apart from feeling physically drained. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much for listening. You can get us the usual show is drops every Monday on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram at Falkirk Daft and it's on to the big one now Ross it is we're recording this on a Tuesday like John said 7,000 tickets sold do you think we can sell out the stadium on Saturday? Um, do you know I think this is the closest we've came in a long time obviously we're assuming Dunfermline sell their end out so um be amazing can you imagine 6,000 Bairns in the home end on Saturday we've obviously got I think they said what is it less than 1,200 tickets to now so, uh, left, so it's, yeah, it's approaching 5,000 Falkirk fans just now, which is brilliant. There's going to be some atmosphere in the stadium on uh, Saturday. We'll be there, you'll be there, and we'll be bringing you all a review 
and hopefully it's a good in come Monday because if it's a bad result on Saturday, I don't even want to turn up for this podcast on Monday. <laughs> I really don't. Don't I turn up for work? Well, that's it. You've got a couple of pars. Ah, no, no. But listen, thanks very much for listening to Falk at Daft. And until next time, Ross Wayne. Expect the unexpected, John. Mon the birds.